Well, hey, and welcome to the third episode of the weekly series, Outbreak News Across the Globe. And in this series, if you've been following it, we go over one big story, uh, an outbreak story, infectious disease story, um, from six of the seven continents. We leave out Antarctica, of course. And we start out in alphabetical order, as always, and that's Africa. And I want to start out with Ebola in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And this is uh, the latest numbers. This is from the DRC Ministry of Health on their Twitter page. And about a week ago, we saw that the Ebola case total in DRC, uh, top 3,000, and the death toll topped 2,000. So what do we have as of September 5th? according to this epi epidemiological uh, situation report. Uh, 3,069 total cases and 2,057 total fatalities. So big problem, it's not slowing down, and there's a lot of concern. And that really leads me into the next um, story. And this is out of the Chicago Tribune, and it's um, a piece by former Senator Joseph Lieberman and former Pennsylvania Governor Tom Ridge. And, it's, and this says, commentary, Ebola is raging again and the U.S. is not ready. So let's see what um, Lieberman and Ridge have to say. Five years ago, the Ebola virus broke through inadequate public health systems in West Africa and spread throughout the world. America was lucky. Only a few cases traveled here, but the U.S. government also did not respond as we had reason to expect. And uh, despite assurances that our country would be able to handle such a serious disease, our public health agencies and healthcare institutions made some serious mistakes. True enough. Uh, however, I think all in all, we, considering the situation, we still did pretty well. Uh, there are a lot of... Um, errors and things that we could have done better but you know we had one person come into the country from I can't remember if it was Liberia or Nigeria who was already infected and two nurses became infected um, that worked at that Dallas hospital so all in all we, it was contained pretty well but yeah Lieberman and Ridge do have some um, interesting points, um, important points to make in this uh, commentary. The CDC neglected to consult with OSHA when developing gu guidance for hospitals. It issued the guidelines and then had to reissue them because they had not adequately accounted for air handling systems and missed the mark when it came to PPE, personal protective equipment. Congress waited too long to provide emergency emergency supplemental funding to help our health care and public health infrastructure respond. And one governor quarantined a nurse only because she had provided humanitarian assistance in an area where the disease was prevalent. And of course, that governor was New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. And if you go to the website outbreaknewstoday.com, I was quite critical of Governor Christie's uh, move uh, during that time. Communications to the public about what was happening were disorganized, confusing, and unnecessarily frightening. True enough. Um, I, th I think the scare tactics were at very high levels at that point. And uh, I think uh, the Ebola outbreak, as far as in the United States, was not really put into perspective. Um, but uh, the authors go on to talk about the more current situation, and they say the threat from Ebola is even more serious. World Health Organization has declared it to be a global public health emergency uh, because Ebola has again defied controls and spread to the city of Goma in the DRC. And uh, it's also been seen in um, Uganda in several cases uh, during this outbreak. Now that they're saying that yeah, the declaration probably should have happened sooner. And uh, there's a lot of people that agree with that. There are people that think that, what does the declaration actually do? What are we going to do differently? So that is a debate of sorts. Um, 
it says there are some encouraging signs, right? We have these experimental Ebola drugs that appear to be working. Uh, the CDC and the Health and Human Services seem to be more effective tracking the disease. Um, but on the other hand, changes made previously to help local hospitals in the U.S. better prepare to treat those in, that are infected are not being implemented as designed. And that will have real human consequences the next time Ebola or another highly infectious disease, including a new highly pathogenic strain of influenza, reaches America. Um, during the outbreak five years ago, the West Africa outbreak, 56 hospitals across the U.S. were designated Ebola treatment centers. And this was designed to increase national capacity to care for patients who contracted the disease. Uh, and they're mostly around major airports, big cities, uh, very well-established, well-esteemed hospitals in the country. Um, they were initially equipped with dedicated to clinical care resources, specialized infrastructure, uh, and trained staff that knew how to handle something like Ebola. But since its inception in 2014, fewer resources have been allocated to this hospital network. As a result, these Ebola treatment centers are having difficulty maintaining their ability to respond to Ebola cases that may come again in the U.S. And outbreaks are costly. Um, public health response to Ebola, Zika, MERS, SARS have cost tens of billions of dollars. I mean, we can just go back a few years when Congress was asking for $1.9 billion for Zika. Um, now, Congress can wait until Ebola or some equally deadly infectious disease arrives in our country, overwhelms the state, local, tribal, or territorial health care, and public health capacity, and threatens the lives and then provides millions of emergency supplemental funding. Or, Congress can now recognize that these significant disease events will occur, uh, will continue to occur, and proactive steps are, are really necessary. So, they... Back in 2018, they recommended in a blue ribbon study panel on biodefense that there should be a $2 billion public health emergency fund. And um, hospitals and other healthcare institutions and the public health community would have these the funds they need when they need it to immediately protect our citizens. And they're calling on Congress to take up this recommendation before something like Ebola pops up in the U.S. once again. So, I mean... If you're from the U.S. and you're listening and watching, how concerned are you about Ebola coming to the United States? I'd love to hear more about it. Uh, you can respond below. Um, but yeah, they, they definitely are bringing up some very valid points and some points that are worthy of discussion and debate. So, so basically, that's all I really wanted to cover as far as Ebola. Um, I found this to be the, the most important um, article this week um, concerning that outbreak. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to some other big things to include uh, the African swine fever outbreak in Asia, right? And this has been going on for 13 months now. And the first case was reported in China in August of 2018. And it has expanded, it has spread to several countries. Um, the amount of hogs that have been culled are in the millions. And a lot of these countries, pork production is a massive industry. And pork is a massive part of their uh, diet. So let's go ahead and take a look at see what, what's the latest from the Food and Agricultural Organizations of the UN, or the FAO. Um, and here's a, here's a map of Asia, and you can see a lot of the places that have been hit really hard. Uh, Vietnam and China, of course, have been hit the hardest, and then there's uh, several other countries, and we'll talk about those real quick. So the situation update shows us, let's start with China. Since the Ministry of Agriculture, Agriculture and Rural Affairs confirmed its first ASF outbreak in Liaoning Province on 3 August 2018, 156 outbreaks have been detected in 32 provinces, and about 1,170,000 pigs have been culled. And the latest piece of information coming out of the China area 
is that in Hong Kong, three pigs from a mainland registered pig farm for supply to Hong Kong were admitted to the Shuang Shu slaughterhouse on September 2, found dead on September 3, and tested positive, positive for ASF, or African Swine Fever. So that was uh, earlier this week, uh, big news out of Hong Kong. Um, and the other country that's been hit very, very hard is Vietnam. And it says, since the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development confirmed its first ASF outbreak on February 19 of this year, 63 provinces reported outbreaks and more than 4.5 million pigs have been culled, uh, by far the most. Then other countries that have had outbreaks include Mongolia, uh, North Korea, Laos, Cambodia, and Myanmar. So, um, so this is a this is a very devastating disease to pigs. It does not infect human beings, uh, but the the effect on economies and and food security and all that are very very massive. When you talk about African swine fever, it's very very contagious and a really really big deal. Though we don't hear a whole lot about it in the U.S. media, but we really definitely should. So anyway, that's the latest update out of Asia, and that's the African swine fever situation. Now, if I go over to the Australia Oceania area, and I, I did this two weeks ago because Auckland and New Zealand as a whole are really battling a large measles outbreak for them. And I want to go ahead and revisit that this week. And this is the latest from the New Zealand Ministry of Health. And it's kind of a milestone. Um, New Zealand has topped 1,000 measles cases this year. So it says uh, from January 1st to September 6th this year, there have been 1,059 confirmed cases of measles notified across New Zealand. 881 of these confirmed cases are in Auckland or the Auckland region. So, of course, they're encouraging vaccination, uh, definitely a necessary thing to be doing. But I, as I reported on the website, OutbreakNewsToday.com, during the course of the week, uh, the demand for the MMR vaccine in New Zealand, uh, particularly in the Auckland area, is really skyrocketing. Good thing, a little, a little late, but a good thing. And so, according to reports out of New Zealand, a lot of the clinics there, though, uh, are unable to keep up with the demand and they were have to have people come back at another time just because of uh, the inability to, to store enough of the vaccine and, and just getting the vaccine there so so they are battling that and that's um been uh, quite an issue for new zealand um, particularly in recent months it's gotten uh, a little bit worse okay next continent europe and the outbreak I wanted to talk about in Europe this week was tularemia in Sweden. And I've been keeping a close eye on this on the website, OutbreakNewsToday.com. And in Sweden, uh, apparently it's called Harpist. And uh, the number of cases just since the end of July has really skyrocketed of tularemia in Sweden. So in the past week or so, they've had about 120 more human cases. So the outbreak total as of earlier this week is about 690. So it's probably over 700 by now. So they're seeing a little bit of a slight downturn. However, it's still very unusually high compared to previous years. And it says most of the new cases are reported from the Dalarna and Galvborg region which together have over 400 cases. And um, Orebro counties uh, have seen a decrease in cases, but here we can see um, how things are going. The purple lines on the bar graph, you can see that particularly in the past month, month and a half or so, the number of cases has really shot up in Sweden and I think 2015, that's the orange uh, part of the chart. That year, I think the country had 850 or so human cases. So 
2019 is catching up to 2015, and uh, we'll see how that turns out. I haven't seen any reports of fatalities, so I'm assuming there are none. And if you know of any, uh, go ahead and please let me know in the comment below. But that's uh, the outbreak in Europe that I wanted to touch on this week. Now, in the United States, I want to do an outbreak, and I did a video on this a week or two ago about this lung disease outbreak uh, that's being linked to e-cigarette products. And uh, you can check out the other report that I did dedicated to vaping illness uh, on the YouTube channel about a week or two ago. But this is the latest because they had a news conference yesterday, the CDC and the FDA, and um, we have some new numbers and it says as of September 6, over 450 possible cases of lung disease associated with the use of e-cigarette products have been reported to the CDC from 33 states and one U.S. territory. Uh, and that's the U.S. Virgin Islands. Now, that's up from about 215 cases about a week or so ago. So it's more than doubled. And there was one fatality from Illinois um, in my previous report. Now there's five deaths um, confirmed uh, linked to this uh, e-cigarette issue. And this includes not only the Illinois case, but California, one in Indiana, one in Minnesota, and one in Oregon. So they're, right now the CDC is working with the states to create a case definition. So things will be more consistent as far as reporting. Um, important thing is the CDC says there's no evidence of infectious diseases that have been identified. Therefore, the lung illnesses are likely associated with a chemical exposure. So not an infectious disease situation. I'm sure they've cultured, you know, a lot of these um, patients and, and found nothing. The investigation has not identified any specific substance or e-cigarette product that is linked to all cases. Many patients report using e-cigarette products with liquids that contain uh, cannabinoid products such as THC. So, so they do offer some recommendations. Um, regardless of the ongoing investigation, the CDC says youth and young adults should not use e-cigarette products. Women who are pregnant should not use them. Adults who do not currently use tobacco products should not start using e-cigarette products. Um, if you do use e-cigarette products, you should not buy these products off the street. Uh, you should not modify e-cigarette products or, or the substances. And um, several other uh, uh, recommendations from the CDC. Now there was this uh, MMR, MMWR that came out on Friday also in it talked about five cases that was identified about a year ago in North Carolina. And the researchers uh, outlined some of the stuff they learned from these five cases from last July and August in, in uh, five patients that were identified at two hospitals in North Carolina with acute lung injury potentially associated with e-cigarette use. The patients were all 18 to 35, uh, experienced several days of worsening, dyspnea, nausea, vomiting, abdominal discomfort, and fever. Uh, all patients demonstrated tachypnea with increased work of breathing on examination, hypoxia, bilateral lung infiltrates on the chest x-ray. All five patients shared a history of recent use of marijuana oils or concentrates in e-cigarettes. All the products used were electronic vaping pens, e-cigarettes that had refillable chambers or interchangeable cartridges with THC vaping concentrates or oils, which were all purchased on the street. Three of the patients also used nicotine containing e-cigarettes and two of the patients smoked marijuana or conventional cigarettes, although none used other illicit drugs. All five patients were hospitalized for hypoxemic respiratory failure, three received um, uh, care in the ICU for acute respiratory distress syndrome, 
and one required intubation and mechanical ventilation, and all five did survive. Um, on admission, all patients had an elevated WBC count with a predominance of neutrophils, uh, no eosinophils. They were treated empirically with uh, antibiotics because apparently they probably thought it was a case of bacterial pneumonia early on. Cultures were all negative for bacterial pathogens, um, also for influenza, mycoplasma, and, and Legionella. Computed tomography of the chest revealed diffuse basilar predominant infiltrates with a range of ground glass opacities and nodular or tree in the bud infiltrates on all patients. Three patients underwent bronchoscopy with bronchoalveolar lavage on hospital stays three through five, yielding a combination of neutrophils, lymphocytes, and vacuole-laden macrophages, but without evidence for alveolar hemorrhage or eosinophilia. No bron bronchoscopic lung biopsies were performed. Lavage cytology was stained with oil red O, which confirmed extensive lipid within the alveolar macrophages. All right, so they were all treated with um, uh, prednisone uh, intravenously, and they were eventually discharged on, uh, with oral prednisone. And that says one potential explanation for acute lipoid pneumonia, which is what they basically diagnose these five individuals with, is that the aerosolized oils inhaled from e-cigarettes deposited within their distal airways and alveoli, inciting a local inflammatory response that impaired vital gas exchange. Lipoid pneumonia has long been described from the aspiration of oil into the lungs and has been associated with e-cigarette e use in some case reports. So anyway, so so this, this demonstrates a little bit more information that, than what we do know. Uh, so yeah, probably should avoid this stuff, you know, in a nutshell. And let me go to my last continent, and that would be South America. Uh, South America, South America, Central America, the Caribbean. And this is the latest uh, Pan American Health Organization epidemiological update on diphtheria. And so far in 2019, um, only two countries in Central America, the Caribbean, or South America have reported confirmed diphtheria cases. And it's Haiti and it's Venezuela. So let's take a look at how things are going with that. In Haiti, between uh, week 32 of 2014 and week 30 of 2019, there were 870 probable cases reported, including 110 fatalities. Of these, 281 were confirmed, um, primarily by laboratory criteria. So, as you can see here, that we've got a good case fatality rate. The average over the six years is almost 20%. So, right, one in five patients with diphtheria in Haiti are dying. That tells you how serious of a disease this is. And then in Venezuela, the diphtheria outbreak that began in July 2016 remains ongoing. Since the beginning of the outbreak, as of week 31 of 2019, so that's about a month ago, a total of 2,956 suspected cases were reported. Uh, the bulk of the cases uh, were from 2017 and 2018. So it, there's only been 384, So I say only, but compared to previous years. So it's down a little bit, but 384 in 2019. Um, about a little over 1,700 were, lab, or were confirmed either by clinical criteria or by laboratory criteria. 287 fatalities were reported and 16 of those fatalities have been in 2019 so far. And the highest case fatality rates occur among children five to nine years old um, and then followed by children 10 to 15. So five to 15 year olds are 
the bulk of the cases in Venezuela. So that's the latest on outbreak news across the globe this week. I hope you enjoyed it. Go ahead and share it with your friends. Subscribe to the channel. Comment below. Like the video. And I'll see you next week.